He went to the bathroom and carefully scrubbed the ink away with the gritty, dark brown soap which rasped your skin like sandpaper, and was therefore well adapted for this purpose. He put the diary away in the drawer. It was quite useless to think of hiding it, but he could at least make sure whether or not its existence had been discovered. A hair laid across the page ends was too obvious. With the tip of his finger he picked up an identifiable grain of whitish dust and deposited it on the corner of the cover, where it was bound to be shaken off if the book was moved. Winston was dreaming of his mother. He must, he thought, have been ten or eleven years old when his mother had disappeared. She was a tall, statuesque, rather silent woman, with slow movements and magnificent fair hair. His father, he remembered more vaguely, as dark and thin, dressed always in neat dark clothes. Winston remembered especially the very thin soles of his father's shoes, and wearing spectacles. The two of them must evidently have been swallowed up in one of the first great purges of the fifties. At this moment, his mother was sitting in some place deep down beneath him, with his young sister in her arms. He did not remember his sister at all, except as a tiny, feeble baby, always silent, with large, watchful eyes. Both of them were looking up at him. They were down in some subterranean place, the bottom of a well, for instance, or a very deep grave. But it was a place which, already far below him, was itself moving downwards. They were in the saloon of a sinking ship, looking up at him through the darkening water. There was still air in the saloon, they could still see him, and he them, but all the while they were sinking down, down, into the green waters, which in another moment must hide them from sight forever. He was out in the light and air, while they were being sucked down to death, and they were down there because he was up here. He knew it, and they knew it and he could see the knowledge in their faces. There was no reproach either in their faces, or in their hearts, only the knowledge that they must die in order that he might remain alive, and that this was part of the unavoidable order of things. He could not remember what had happened, but he knew in his dream that in some way the lives of his mother and his sister had been sacrificed to his own. It was one of those dreams which while retaining the characteristic dream scenery, are a continuation of one's intellectual life, and in which one becomes aware of facts and ideas which still seem new and valuable after one is awake. The thing that now suddenly struck Winston was that his mother's death, nearly thirty years ago, had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Tragedy, he perceived, belonged to the ancient time, to a time when there was still privacy, love and friendship, and when the members of a family stood by one another without needing to know the reason. His mother's memory tore at his heart because she had died loving him, when he was too young and selfish to love her in return, and because somehow, he did not remember how, she had sacrificed herself to a conception of loyalty that was private and unalterable. Such things, he saw, could not happen today. Today, there were fear, hatred, and pain, but no dignity of emotion, no deep or complex sorrows. All this he seemed to see in the large eyes of his mother and his sister, looking up at him through the green water, hundreds of fathoms down and still sinking. Suddenly he was standing on short springy turf, on a summer evening when the slanting rays of the sun gilded the ground. 
The landscape that he was looking at recurred so often in his dreams that he was never fully certain whether or not he had seen it in the real world. In his waking thoughts, he called it the Golden Country. It was an old, rabbit-bitten pasture, with a foot track wandering across it and a molehill here and there. In the ragged hedge on the opposite side of the field, the boughs of the elm trees were swaying very faintly in the breeze their leaves just stirring in dense masses like women's hair. Somewhere near at hand, though out of sight, there was a clear, slow-moving stream where dace were swimming in the pools under the willow trees. The girl with dark hair was coming towards them across the field. With what seemed a single movement, she tore off her clothes and flung them disdainfully aside. Her body was white and smooth, but it aroused no desire in him. Indeed, he barely looked at it. What overwhelmed him in that instant was admiration for the gesture with which she had thrown her clothes aside. With its grace and carelessness, it seemed to annihilate a whole culture, a whole system of thought, as though Big Brother and the party and the thought police could all be swept into nothingness by a single, splendid movement of the arm. That, too, was a gesture belonging to the ancient time. Winston woke up with the word Shakespeare on his lips. The telescreen was giving forth an ear-splitting whistle, which continued on the same note for 30 seconds. It was 0-7-15, getting up time for office workers. Winston wrenched his body out of bed, Naked, for a member of the outer party received only 3,000 clothing coupons annually, and a suit of pyjamas was 600, and seized a dingy singlet and a pair of shorts that were lying across a chair. The physical jerks would begin in three minutes. The next moment he was doubled up by a violent coughing fit, which nearly always attacked him soon after waking up. It emptied his lungs so completely that he could only begin breathing again by lying on his back and taking a series of deep gasps. His veins had swelled with the effort of the cough, and the varicose ulcer had started itching. Thirty to forty group, yapped a piercing female voice. Thirty to forty group, take your places please. Thirties to forties. Winston sprang to attention in front of the telescreen, upon which the image of a youngish woman, scrawny but muscular, dressed in tunic and gym shoes, had already appeared. Arms bending and stretching, she rapped out. Take your time by me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Come on, comrades, put a bit of life into it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The pain of the coughing fit had not quite driven out of Winston's mind the impression made by his dream, and the rhythmic movements of the exercise restored it somewhat, as he mechanically shot his arms back and forth, wearing on his face the look of grim enjoyment which was considered proper during the physical jerks. He was struggling to think his way backward into the dim period of his early childhood. It was extraordinarily difficult. Beyond the late fifties, everything faded. When there were no external records that you could refer to, even the outline of your own life lost its sharpness. You remembered huge events, which had quite probably not happened. You remembered the detail of incidents without being able to recapture their atmosphere, and there were long blank periods to which you could assign nothing. Everything had been different then. Even the names of countries and their shapes on the map had been different. Airstrip 1, for instance, had not been so called in those days. It had been called England, or Britain, though London, he felt fairly certain, had always been called London. Winston could not definitely remember a time when his country had not been at war, but it was evident that there had been a fairly long interval of peace during his childhood, because one of his early memories was of an air raid, which appeared to take everyone by surprise. Perhaps it was the time when the atomic bomb had fallen on Colchester. He did not remember the raid itself, but he did remember his father's hand clutching his own as they hurried down, 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 
into some place deep in the earth, round and round a spiral staircase which rang under his feet and which finally so wearied his legs that he began whimpering and they had to stop and rest. His mother, in her slow, dreamy way, was following a long way behind them. She was carrying his baby sister. Or perhaps it was only a bundle of blankets that she was carrying. He was not certain whether his sister had been born then. Finally, they had merged into a noisy, crowded place, which he had realised to be a tube station. There were people sitting all over the stone-flagged floor, and other people, packed tightly together, were sitting on metal bunks, one above the other. Winston and his mother and father found themselves a place on the floor, and near them an old man and an old woman were sitting side by side on a bunk. The old man had on a decent dark suit and a black cloth cap pushed back from very white hair. His face was scarlet, and his eyes were blue and full of tears. He reeked of gin. It seemed to breathe out of his skin in place of sweat, and one could have fancied that the tears welling from his eyes were pure gin. But though slightly drunk, he was also suffering under some grief that was genuine and unbearable. In his childish way, Winston grasped that some terrible thing, something that was beyond forgiveness and could never be remedied, had just happened. It also seemed to him that he knew what it was. Someone whom the old man loved, a little granddaughter perhaps, had been killed. Every few minutes the old man kept repeating. We didn't ought to have trusted him. I said so, Ma, didn't I? That's what comes of trusting him. I said so all along. We didn't ought to have trusted the buggers. But which buggers they didn't ought to have trusted? Winston could not now remember. Since about that time, war had been literally continuous, though strictly speaking it had not always been the same war. For several months during his childhood there had been confusing street fighting in London itself, some of which he remembered vividly. But to trace out the history of the whole period, to say who was fighting whom at any given moment, would have been utterly impossible, since no written record and no spoken word ever made mention of any other alignment than the existing one. At this moment, for example, in 1984, if it was 1984, Oceania was at war with Eurasia and in alliance with East Asia. In no public or private utterance was it ever admitted that the three powers had at any time been grouped along different lines. Actually, as Winston well knew, it was only four years since Oceania had been at war with East Asia and in alliance with Eurasia. But that was merely a piece of furtive knowledge which he happened to possess because his memory was not satisfactorily under control. Officially, the change of partners had never happened. Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. The enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. The frightening thing, he reflected, for the ten thousandth time as he forced his shoulders painfully backward, with hands on hips, they were gyrating their bodies from the waist, an exercise that was supposed to be good for the back muscles. The frightening thing was that it might all be true. If the party could thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened, that surely was more terrifying than mere torture and death. The party said Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia as short a time as four years ago. But where did that knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past? 
ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. And yet the past, though of its nature alterable, had never been altered. Whatever was true now was true from everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All that was needed was an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it. In new speak, double think. Stand easy, barked the instructress, a little more genially. Winston sank his arms to his sides and slowly refilled his lungs with air. His mind slid away into the labyrinthine world of doublethink. To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. To hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them. To use logic against logic. To repudiate morality while laying claim to it. To believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy. To forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. And above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety. Consciously to induce unconsciousness, and then, once again, to become unconscious of the act of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. The instructress had called them to attention again. And now let's see which of us can touch our toes she said enthusiastically. Right over from the hips, please, comrades. One, two, one, two. Winston loathed this exercise, which sent shooting pains all the way from his heels to his buttocks and often ended bringing on another coughing fit. The half-pleasant quality went out of his meditations. The past, he reflected, had not merely been altered, it had been actually destroyed. For how could you establish even the most obvious fact when there existed no record outside your own memory? He tried to remember in what year he had first heard mention of Big Brother. He thought it must have been at some time in the sixties, but it was impossible to be certain. In the party histories, of course, Big Brother figured as a leader and guardian of the revolution since its very earliest days. His exploits had been gradually pushed backwards in time, until already they extended into the fabulous world of the forties and the thirties, when the capitalists in their strange cylindrical hats still rode through the streets of London in great gleaming motor cars or horse carriages with glass sides. There was no knowing how much of this legend was true and how much invented. Winston could not even remember at what date the party itself had come into existence. He did not believe he had ever heard the word Ingsoc before 1960, but it was possible that in its old-speak form, English socialism, that is to say, it had been current earlier. Everything melted into mist. Sometimes, indeed, you could put your finger on a definite lie. It was not true, for example, as was claimed in the party history books, that the party had invented aeroplanes. He remembered aeroplanes since his earliest childhood. But you could prove nothing. There was never any evidence. Just once in his whole life, he had held in his hands unmistakable documentary proof of the falsification of an historical fact. And on that occasion... Smith! screamed the shrewish voice from the telescreen. 6079 Smith W. Yes, you. Bend lower, please. You can do better than that. You're not trying. Lower, please. That's better, comrade. 
Now stand at ease, the whole squad, and watch me. A sudden hot sweat had broken out all over Winston's body. His face remained completely inscrutable. Never show dismay. Never show resentment. A single flicker of the eyes could give you away. He stood watching while the instructress raised her arms above her head and, one could not say gracefully, but with remarkable neatness and efficiency, bent over and tucked the first joint of her fingers under her toes. There, comrades, that's how I want to see you doing it. Watch me again. I'm thirty-nine and I've had four children. Now, look. She bent over again. You see, my knees aren't bent. You can all do it if you want to, she added as she straightened herself up. Anyone under 45 is perfectly capable of touching his toes. We don't all have the privilege of fighting in the front line, but at least we can all keep fit. Remember our boys on the Malabar front and the sailors in the floating fortresses. Just think what they have to put up with. Now try again. That's better, comrade. That's much better, she added encouragingly as Winston, with a violent lunge, succeeded in touching his toes with knees unbent for the first time in several years. With the deep, unconscious sigh which not even the nearness of the telescreen could prevent him from uttering when his day's work started, Winston pulled the speak right towards him, blew the dust from its mouthpiece, and put on his spectacles. Then he unrolled and clipped together four small cylinders of paper which had already flopped out of the pneumatic tube on the right-hand side of his desk. In the walls of the cubicle, there were three orifices. To the right of the speak right, a small pneumatic tube for written messages. To the left, a larger one for newspapers. And in the side wall, within easy reach of Winston's arm, a large oblong slit protected by a wire grating. Thank you so very much for listening. Stephen here, checking in with you at the end of another chapter of 1984. And after that preview of chapter 4, it seems like we're going to get a little bit more detail regarding the everyday working life of Winston in the ministry. I like that not so much can really happen, and yet we just get deeper and deeper into this world that Orwell is constructing for us. Winston wakes from a dream that is clearly connected to his past and is offering up certain reflections of his current state of affairs. And then he's forced to engage in the physical jerks, a daily exercise routine that all party members seem to have to be involved in. And you know, that's it. There's not a lot going on. But yet, like I say, we learn ever more, gain greater context all the time and get sucked into this world. And as dark as some of these themes are, again, as I mentioned at the end of chapter two, I just can't help but smile at times and really have fun with it. I liked this particular sentence as he mechanically shot his arms back and forth, wearing on his face the look of grim enjoyment which was considered proper during the physical jerks. He was struggling to think his way backward into the dim period of his early childhood. Orwell's choice of words sometimes, it's quite simple really, but just so fun. Wearing on his face the look of grim enjoyment which was considered proper. It's lovely. It's so depressing, but beautifully written. 
do share in the comments any reflections, thoughts and feelings that you might be having whilst listening. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for all of you that support me over on Patreon. Thank you to my channel members here on YouTube. Thank you for those super thanks. And there's been a couple of very generous donations through PayPal over the last couple of weeks. So if you're listening, thank you so very much. It really means a lot. And of course, thank you for being here. I love to read your comments and hear what you think about it all. It makes the whole thing so interesting and vital and rewarding. So I'll be back in just a few days time with the next chapter. Until then, you take care wherever you are and whatever you're up to. And I'll read to you soon.